Okay, welcome again to the Beit Yachon. We'll continue with the reading of this book from the Christian Miscellany, which seems to be a journal uh, from the Family Visitor for the year 1868, Second Series, Volume 14, London, Wesleyan Conference Office, uh, 1868. So this is an old book, and this is just a, a testimony about some missionaries to the Islamic or the world of slaves. Okay. Um, they, in this book, they actually use the term Muhammadism, Muhammadanism. Uh, this was where they were in those days because they saw the such focus on Muhammad that they couldn't see the other. Okay. Um, but we notice also that they still know the name Muslim. They still have that name. Okay, so uh, where did I get to? Okay. Yes. Surely the all-constraining love of our crucified Saviour and the quickening presence of our risen Lord cannot prove less powerful to stimulate holy exertion and to prompt self-sacrificing devotion than the interest which attaches to his empty sepulchre and to the place of his crucifixion. Such considerations will surely impress some hearts and stir up a desire to see the present comparative inertness on the part of Christendom. In reference to this subject, exchange for an active and enlightened zeal on behalf of the deluded millions who are followers of the false prophet, as British Christians we have the example of our own Henry Martin, who went forth alone and with no other assistance in unequal contest than what he could derive from the small tract on Mohammedanism. Though of course a weak Though of a weak constitution, he yet struggled though on the, the one Christian missionary in the empire of Persia until he laid his bones to rest among the people he longed to bring to the knowledge of the Saviour of mankind. We have the treasure of a missionary's dust in Persia, and shall we do nothing to show how we honour it? Our author tells us that the first allusion to anything like a recognition of our duty towards the Muslims occurs in 1649, when Edward Terry, preached a sermon before the governor and company of merchants trading in India, and when speaking of the Mohammedans of that country, he enforced the need of holiness of life, lest what he had sometimes heard from their lips should be repeated, that is, Christian religion, devil religion, Christian much drunk, much rogue, much naught, very much naught. Until quite recently, it was deemed impossible to undertake direct missionary work among the Muslims because their respective governments had always visited apostasy from Islam with capital punishment. Yet even amidst these difficulties, inaction was unjustifi unjustifiable. Were we to believe that the fusion of Christianity impossible without the sanction of or cooperation of secular power, we, we should be imitating those followers of the Quran who relied upon the sword for success. Henry Martin sacrificed his life to the Muslims for Christ's sake when the laws of Muslim bigotry were yet in full force and when there seemed no possible access to the Mohammedan in the East. Neither the apostles nor successors in martyrdom waited until any one of the governing powers had withdrawn active opposition to Christianity. The church for 300 years had all the governments of the world and all courts of justice against her, yet she conquered and survived all opposing powers. To hold that Christianity without secular aid can neither extend its boundaries nor protect its articles of faith is to confess the weakness which it cannot be guilty. It was just between the 3rd and 6th centuries when the church was placed under the immediate protection of civil government that those damnable heresies were brought in which could alone render the rise of Islam a possibility. If difficulty and discouragement were fitting arguments against the performance of a duty, any society or any number of societies might well shrink from the task of repairing the breach which the Church, through Islam, has for the last twelve centuries sustained. But our Lord bids us to go into all the world and to preach the gospel to every creature. And unless it can be satisfactorily proved that two hundred millions who profess Islam are not expressly excluded, we dare not refuse to deliver God's message of mercy to them, whether they will hear or whether they will forbear. Of the 200 millions of Muslims in the world, 
fifteen millions are our fellow subjects and have therefore peculiar claims upon us. Some of the signs of the times are very significant. The public press, the writer continues, gives contract, constant records of the widespreading changes in Turkey and Egypt, where commerce, education, social and political reforms are sapping the foundations of Islam. In the Turkish Empire and in the Egypt, electric telegraphs and steam appliances are ploughing up the stiff soil of a petrified fanaticism and bigotry. Nor is this great change confined to the social, intellectual and political life. There is a spirit of inquiry pervading the religious element. In Egypt we find a Muslim writing a theological work to disprove the veracity of his own religion. At Constantinople, answers are being written to Dr. Fander's controversial writings. In India, bilingual commentary on the Holy Bible in English and Urdu is written by one of the most learned and zealous Muslim doctors of the present age, Sait Sindh Ahmud Khan, P. Subda Amin. In this work, the Bible and the Quran are placed upon the same footing, being regarded as equally inspired and equally binding upon Muslims. It is almost amusing to find the last-named Muslim theologian writing to our author as follows. I am doubtless as staunch an adherent and defender of the Bible as yourself. I have resolved to reply to Dr. Colenso's objections in the proper parts of my commentary, as I come to pass, to pass by them. This commentary asserting, as it does, the authority of the Bible and proving such from the Quran itself, in opposition to the hitherto assumed corruption of Christian scriptures, deserves to be translated into every tongue spoken by Muslims, especially the, into Arabic. For no greater service could be rendered them than of raising the Bible in their estimation to the level of the Quran. Let this be done by the Muslims themselves, and it will then demand little ingenuity, ingenuity or zeal on the part of Christians to prove that if the Bible be true, the Quran must be false. Other tokens indicate that the Muslims themselves believe that soon their power will be gone and that they must disappear before the fair-haired race who will overthrow the empire of Ishmael and conquer the seven-hilled city with its imperial privileges. Who then is willing to lift up the standard for Christ and to go in and take possession of so vast a field in his name? So this came from a Christian miscellany. And it was written in, this book was from 1868. The actual author of this uh, thing, I don't find a name. Um, but one thing I think we can be sure of is that he is now dead. Now, as we know, we as Christians believe in Yahweh. And we believe in the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We believe in one God. We believe that anyone who believes that Yahuwah does not have a son is telling lies. Why? Because the Bible says very clearly, I will declare the decree of Yahuwah. He said to me, you are my son, this day I have begotten you. We also believe that anyone who denies that Jesus Christ was crucified on the cross of Calvary is telling lies. Why? Because the crucifixion and the resurrection of Jesus Christ are the very foundation of God's word. Amen? God's word all moved towards that crucifixion and resurrection from the time when Adam sinned and therefore all mankind was born in death was mankind crying out for the solution to the problem of death and that came with the crucifixion and the resurrection of Jesus Christ without that crucifixion there is no forgiveness of our sins because he took our sins upon himself and without that resurrection there is no solution to man's greatest problem, death. Every man dies. The evidence that there is a resurrection is in Jesus Christ because he is the first who resurrected from the dead. And after he rose from the dead, there were 500 eyewitnesses who saw him. There were eyewitnesses who saw him die. I believe Thomas was one of those eyewitnesses. He said, unless I see the nails in his hands and the wound in his side, I will not believe. Which means he was an eyewitness of what happened to Jesus on the cross. Hallelujah. And he needed real evidence to prove that Jesus was risen from the dead. Amen. So as Christians, as believers in Yahweh, we have a duty to pray for the Muslim world. We believe that it is Satan who denies Jesus Christ. Amen. So let us begin to pray and believe and trust that Yahweh will be glorified. Amen.